So it's got nothing to do with Formula One. Uh, <laughs> but this picture came out last night, practice at Singapore Grand Prix, and it's uh, Kamui Kobayashi. Of course, good picture. <laughs> so, um, my name is Tom uh, I'm the founder, and I'm the engineering team of Kudu. Um, I'm going to assume nobody's heard of a Kudu, so the first few slides are what we do and why and so on. And I do have some notes. So, what do we do? Well, this is what the world looked like, or my world looked like in 1990. You have your small database, it's a SQL database. Typically a B-tree index, if you're really lucky, you've got a B-tree file system, otherwise I don't think they exist at that point. Um, some RAID, hardware RAID, some old hardware. To give you an example, hardware back then, a 486 if you're lucky. You know, four megabytes of RAM, a few hundred megabytes of disk space. You could do, uh, I don't know, that you could do about 270k a second random 4k I/O on these disks. You could do about 30 megaseconds sequential I/O. Uh, nowadays, we're talking about big data. We're talking about distributed, shared mapping databases. We're talking about write optimized indexes. Still on top of B-tree file systems. Still on top of RAID, and now sometimes software RAID. But now we've got new hardware. We've got many cores. We've got SSDs. We've got very large disks. An example of a very large disk, you know, 3 terabyte, 2 terabyte disk. The difference now between random I.O. and sequential I.O., uh, you know, you do about 400k a second random I.O., you can do about 100 megasecond sequential I.O. That's a factor of 250, whereas previously it was a factor of 100. This gap is growing bigger and bigger. So, what do we do? Well, we replace all the old stuff in the middle, built on those old assumptions, with some new algorithms. Uh, we've integrated it all. You no longer have a file system, you no longer have a RAID system, you no longer have indexes, it's all just one big block. Um, and I'll explain what's in that block later. So, why do we do this? It's probably the most important question. Well, lots of people are starting to process huge amounts of data and you know, serve it to the real world. And we really want to avoid situations like this. Um, no offense to the other guys. <laughs>
things, then they see their edits in real time on, on two different systems. And you know, we use things like a camera SSL, um, which is interesting to use. That's probably more a reflection of open SSL than a camera SSL. Anyway, so let's look at the system. This is our big block diagram. Each one of these is a daemon. Daemons are responsible for a set of classes, and we have a daemon that aggregates all together. So let's, let's just zoom in a bit. So the first set are just boring daemons that work as bridges to other systems. So uh, if you look at Cassandra, Cassandra exports a thrift interface. And so clients and controls will need to talk thrift to uh, talk to them. But our user interface doesn't talk thrift, it talks this JSON uh, RPC protocol. So this Cassandra daemon is pretty much just an adapter that translates JSON RPC, uh, JSON, RESTful JSON into proof. That's pretty much what it does. Um, we've also got some bindings into Castle, so this is another Camel C library. Um, the only really interesting thing that Cassandra does, we have a, the tool stack's aware of all the hosts in the cluster, and Cassandra uses an event feed off this pub sub mechanism, off the daemon that holds the list of hosts. Um, to notice when a new host gets added and resynchronize Cassandra and bootstrap that host into the Cassandra cluster. So it's got some event driven deployment logic, but you know, it's not rocket science. So, slightly better is, is the more interesting side, side of the tool stack, the management stack. So, the clustering, this, this system uses gossip to gossip about cluster membership, um, maintains a list of hosts. Uh, maintains also a list of services on each host, so you can see if something's crashed or you know get logs and things like this. Uh, we've got failure detectors in there. We use a fire approval failure detector to decide when hosts are dead. And this apparently is very good, but I didn't write it. Um, what else we've got? So the interesting thing about the stats, you know, it's just a stats collection framework, but again, it uses the same event mechanism. And you describe rules. This is what this default report object is. You describe a rule to say whenever a version or a disk gets added or a collection gets added, these rules say create a new report gathering these statistics about that object. So this event-driven sort of rule-based monitoring and alerting does the same thing. Is is kind of neat, very flexible. It works really well if SASD fails for some reason. You can start it back up. It will catch up on its events and recreate all the things it missed. So that that can be. So, final bit, routing. So we have a daemon that connects together. So all of these daemons expose a subset of this RESTful JSON interface. And this daemon just aggregates together that, those subsets and, and exposes the full interface. And it also route between multiple, this arrow is going on to another machine, route between multiple routers on the other machine. So you might ask what's the routing system? Well, it's really straightforward. Each object has a UUID. That keeps a big map of UUID to host. Really, really simple. Um, and in fact, for the local host, it doesn't need to keep that map because most of the time, a class only ever lives in one daemon, so it always knows the request for that class just goes to that daemon. Right, and this also aggregates the PubSub system, so the, a user interface. So from a web browser, you can only connect to one machine, or you can only easily connect to one machine. Um, so this, this works as a sort of single point you can connect the web browser to. And then this will do the fan out and talk to the business search. So, that is the tool stack, sort of in a nutshell, talking about you know, what went well. Well, I've only been using OCaml for about five years. Um, so, one of the things I'm discovering here is that a lot of things I thought were wrong with the language, it turns out I just don't know about. Um, so, for instance, one of my criticisms was the build system is terrible. And I've now learned I should be using OCaml. We've got over a thousand lines of make files, so trust me when I go back, I'm going to use a camera board. Um, what works with our functors? We love functors. Uh, we actually are one of the few people I've met who use objects in our camera. So all of these, um, all of these things are actual classes, and we actually have instances of them sitting in the cache table, and it works really well. Um, I think the reason it works really well is because we auto generate them, so, so developers never see it. Um, but it, it, it works really well. It was easy, to, easy and quick to implement. It took us about 18 months to get to this stage. Uh, RV1 is out. People are actually using this code now. Um, yeah. And the usual, the usual things about accounts. It's actually quite easy to hire a account. Like you probably have a
have a bigger team so you have other issues. But for us, getting the Ono panel developed has been quite easy. If they have a panel on their CV, they tend to be a good developer. Um, things, you know, things I wish were different. I wish we had a better standard library or a more inclusive standard library. And I'm now going to be investigating core and probably using that. I wish I'd used LWT. Um, do you notice know, this is a very sort of network system? And we have a lot of threads blocked on network IO. And all the associated problems with killing that thread when the network's going to time out in three hours or something. So, that's kind of the pros and cons. Oh, the other con of OCaml. We have a very large kernel development team which develop our storage engine castle. And they're very sort of resistant to OCaml. So, uh, I end up having to do all the glue code. So, that's, a, that's been a good thing. But I'm hoping to kind of actually get them to do some training and get them to understand how OCaml works. And, I think they'll love it. So, I'm going to stop here for a minute. Does anyone have any slides on, uh, any questions on that? Merging together streams. 
data on this. So this is supposed to be, you know, remember I said at the beginning, this is a 250 times faster or even more at a sequential IMGR randomizer. So this system allows you to keep arrays on this in sorted order, nice and merged. You can go and play with this if you like. It's not mine. No, 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 I'll get back to the. That'll probably crash us far as well because it does tend to cause nothing. So if we look at, compare a structured B tree to a double array, they do roughly the same thing. You can insert into them, you can read from them. Log structured B tree, a <coughs> log structured B tree is you're inserting into the B tree, you copy the path down the B tree and link it back into the old B tree and then insert that into the head of the log. Is that everyone with me there? I'm seeing a few more. So what you can see is that's really good when the B tree fits in memory, but the minute that the B tree, the internal nodes of B tree start falling out of memory, you have to start then reading back on your log to figure out, you know, what I have to copy. You know, it's in the name, it's copy on right, oh, well, it's not in the name, but people always say copy on right. So this is why you have to do random IO, and I've got some graphs to show this later. But you know, and the normal log VM comes from the fact that it's a B tree. You know, and you've got log B levels. Right, and so a double array, you've got the same log n, and that's because you've got the arrays doubled in size as you go down. So your, your arrays in the bottom level contain half your data, and your arrays going down contain less and less and less. So that's where the log n comes from. And because you do IOs in, in blocks of B, that's where the over B comes from. And as I said before, it's sequential. So let's break this down a bit. So what does, for a very large data set, you're looking to do five, five bios every other day for a tree. And for a, a double MRA, you're doing like 0.2 of the bio. And these are actually quite hazardous these blocks. So what does that mean? How many blocks can you do? How many IOs can you do a second sequential versus random? And so how many inserts can you do? B tree can do 20 inserts a second for a very large data set, whereas double MRA can do 65,000, which is more than Tools of language. Why is there no log factor in your query? Why is there no log factor in the query? So we're assuming these are large. We're assuming Z is bigger than log n. So the, does that make sense? No. So there's one log n lookup into each array. Oh, a single log n lookup. So no, well, there, in this case, because we've got log n arrays, there's a log n squares, because you log n arrays, and then in each array you've got to do a primary search. And then you do Z over the IOs to copy out all the others. So in this case, we're assuming Z is much bigger than log N. No, I understand. Thanks. That's, sorry, I should have put um, So, this is the data structure we eventually chose from the Ocaml file system. And this is the kind of output we got from our Ocaml file system. So, this is a, a block trace of a B tree doing inserts. So, time on here, block index on here, green is. Uh, right and red is a read, and you can see it's pretty random because we predicted. Mm -hmm. Okay, we literally just, you know, print f block ID into a log and then plot it with the loop. <coughs> if you look at the double array, very, very sequential. You know, this is the best way of visualizing what you know. So these stupid monks you will note, note that this runs for about half the amount of time as the other one, so it's a bit misleading, but I couldn't find the, the comparative graphs. So that's, that's the block trace, visualized, block index, time. If you look at insert rate, this is the Ocaml prototype file system. This is a dummy, uh, this is a B tree here, tailing off as the uh, elements fall out of cache. And this is the dummy array, not tailing off, we're maintaining the flat as you well, one over log n. But that's lost because it's so small. So, why did the Ocaml prototype not really work? Basically, the long, long and short bit is we moved to, moved to Java. Um, why? Well, this is actually, it actually happened about the same time I moved off this project and went on to the rhythm implementation. Um, we always knew this would just be a, a prototype, but you know, we wanted, there were still more things we wanted to evaluate. It was also, because the whole point of this was trying out lots and lots of different algorithms. You know, the DA that I've explained here is actually a really, really simple version of what we're doing. Okay, and there's been probably 18 months more development on the idea of DA since we got those results. Um, and we have a paper in FAST, or Hot Storage, explaining
explaining the newer developments in our day. Now the problem was, every time we had a new idea, we had to refactor stuff in OCaml, and we tried to write them nice and modulary, but we never got the module definitions right. So we were constantly, we found we were spending more time, you know, re-engineering, you know, marshalling layers and, and communication layers and things in OCaml than we were implementing the base structure. You know, the data structure definitions fit on an app, but then all of the supporting code to get them on and off of disk and, and keep the merge and amortized and all this sort of stuff, just, it was a nightmare. And the performance wasn't that good. The previous graph, this set us down at about 10,000 inserts, it's a long log, so it's confusing, but it set us down at about 10,000 inserts a second. Um, now 10,000, I think this is 4K, no, 4 byte keys and values. So 10,000 inserts a second is about a megabyte a second. So we're doing, we're, we're not IO bound here, we're, we're a factor of 100 away from IO bound, we're completely disabled now. Okay, that might sound amazing, but there's a good explanation for that. So we did switch to, uh, to Java. Um, we found in Java it's much easier to refactor stuff in Java. In fact, I could discuss it for you. 10 minutes, okay. Um, much easier to marshal on and off disk. Byte buffers are great, there's lots of support for that. There are lots of easy performance ones as well with Java. I mean, our code was really bad. It was a prototype. It was designed to get stuff done as quickly as possible. So it was a mess. And it was really easy to, you know, multi thread it in Java. It was really easy to just kind of make a few tweaks. And in Java, it did go faster. So we spent a lot less time working on the Java prototype. And once it's a very noisy graph, it's about six times faster. In the end. Same algorithm. This is actually a slightly improved version of the algorithm, but it actually, you know, it won't make it that won't account for factor of six. So I'm not saying Java is a faster language than OCaml. Okay, I like OCaml, I don't like Java. Um, but it was easier for a team that doing this implementation to get better performance quickly out of Java than it was out of OCaml, which is so, what would have stopped us using Java? Well, I now know about the camel bit strings, so um, maybe that will solve most of our marshalling problems. Um, I don't know why they're not included by default when you download a camel, but they probably should be. Uh, the other thing, so I've done some work with Python before, and Python has this really nice library for doing multiprocessing. So Python has similar problems to a camel in terms of not being able to do true multiprocessing, and it has a library where you just go root process and it will set up communication channels for you and it's really easy to use. And I don't know whether a camel has one, but if it doesn't, it should. And it should probably be in the standard library. Or in whatever gets shipped with a camel. Um, okay, so finally, what about Castle? So Castle is the thing we actually ship to customers. This is the re-implementation in C that we spent a long time perfecting. It's got loads more features in it than what I've talked about. But uh, yeah, how is this? So Castle in C, in the Linux kernel as well, it's tux. Uh, it's implemented the kernel module, it replaces the RAID layer, it's got shared memory interfaces, it's great. Um, and if you're really interested, I'm giving another talk just about Castle um, next week in London. Anyway, so how did this perform? Well, this is a graph I pulled, terrible graph, I pulled from uh, the test machines just before this talk. And this shows you're doing about 150,000 inserts a second. So it's about three, four times faster than the, uh, than the Java one. Actually, it's like three times faster than Java. What's interesting is it also shows you the mergers. So this is a, a status monitor that outputs a blob every time it merges, and you can see the kind of logarithmic pattern as you go down the lane. I like this. But yeah, if you don't believe me, there's a zoomed in doing about 160,000 So, we actually, I was actually expecting it to be faster than that. The one we got V1 was about one and a half times faster than this. But this is, you know, this is trunk development, so obviously quite right, One more thing before you can all now ask me for doing a camel um, One of the things you lose when you go to a doubling array is version. And I mean versioning like persist, uh, persistent version, like snapshots of clones. Uh, you get them with a copy of my B tree, um, you don't get the big data, and you can't use a copy of my B tree for big data because it's performance breaks. So we have written a system for doubling arrays, which give you back snapshots of code, so you can actually prove a more optimal than copy of my B trees. And that's what the paper in Glass or Hot Storage was about. Um, 
um, I'd have time to film that. So I'm giving this talk in London next week. If you're interested, it will be on the uh, it'll be on the internet. That's the end. So I had to whistle for quite a Yeah, I'm slowly discovering this probably just so. I mean, marshalling was 
was quite expensive in the candle as well. So getting a nature on and off disc was, uh, was quite expensive. I mean, we started off with, with Marshall, that turned out to be slow, we wrote our own Marshall code, that turned out to be brittle, so eventually we went back to Marshall. Um, now I know about bit strings, which may go and test to see if they're faster. But yeah, but again, that's a, a library issue as opposed to a language issue. Well, we don't know the library is. I suspect, I mean, I suspect the bit strings will be allowed to pass the Michael? Yeah, do you remember the code sizes of your OCaml prototype and your Java prototype? The Java prototype is about 30,000 lines of code, the OCaml one is also about 30,000 lines of code, but the OCaml one implements about 10 different algorithms. <laughs> As I said, the algorithm is actually a small part of that. It's the marshalling and the maintenance of all the data structures and keeping things going that's, it's, that takes up most of the lines of code. I want to be the, the account prototype is abandoned right now. I mean, it's sitting in an HG repository in our offices and there's no work going on, but I want to get it out. I want to tidy it up and get it out and just kind of, you know, it's got some really cool algorithms in it. So, so you, you're selling all this as a failure. Oh, Camel didn't work perfectly. We had to build the final version in the Java. We actually built the final version in C. So this was just for prototype. Right. So couldn't you sell this as uh, Oh, Camel worked for us perfectly. It let us go through all the different alternatives <coughs> quickly to find the one that we um, then needed to work on doing better prototypes out. Um, I mean, ideally, if it worked perfectly, we wouldn't have moved the Java. And it does sound like, you know, we've learned a lot now. It sounds like maybe we could have improved it. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I, I wish we hadn't had to spend the month we were meant to be up. I wish we could have spent that on just focusing on the outcome. So that's the thing. Was your question in the back? I was just going to say, um, could you like uh, attribute any of the speed of the redevelopment in Java to the fact that you already implemented the algorithm sure. before? Yeah, sure, of course that makes sense. Um, I mean, the Java one though is significantly more complicated now than the uh, camel ever was. Um, really if you search SDA or stratified B tree, that's the thing we now have in Java. And that deals with all the versioning and stuff, whereas the you know, camel can kind of do so. Uh, so. So you mentioned that Java's uh, refactoring is Yes, and I was interested about it because one of the things I really like about the language and the Hindu number 10 system is the way that the type of code itself shows the way that the algorithm and the architecture kind of the messages that connect different parts of the system together. And you get actually quite, you know, think back to the you know, the compiler tells the world, like, here's what we need to think. And these other places where it's kind of sitting there, you don't need to get there. And so I'm wondering what was it about, what was it, what were the kind of refactors that were easier to do in Java than in your career? When you're talking to the first level, which is what So I've done, I did the account. There wasn't really a problem that I felt. It's, you know, I, I like that. But the guys who ended up working on the project improving upon my work found it hard to be back to found, you know, Java, being able to, you know, I don't really know, I'm not a Java programmer, but uh, I've heard terms like releasing and stuff like that and all sorts of things. Yeah, I mean, I'll admit, I don't really, I don't fully buy that. I'm really <coughs> sure. I just don't think they were smart enough to work on a camera book. Maybe that's <laughs> another <laughs> There are some references if you want to learn about any of the stuff I didn't really go into. So, and the slides are on Twitter. Probably minus the 